Hey guys, testing, testing, testing the audio real quick. Give me a minute. All right. Oh. Okay, you can hear me. Sounds good. All right, all right, all right. Audio's working. Hey, how are you guys? Welcome, welcome. Audio sounds good? Okay, I'm gonna maybe bring it a little closer to me. Hi. Um, hey guys, yeah, hi everybody in the chat. Thanks for coming by, Jay. Yeah, it's been a minute. Um, yesterday was fun. We did a little movie watching and painting stream. I'm not putting that on YouTube because we know how much trouble that we've had on YouTube for the B movie, the invasion of the B girl. So if you're watching this on YouTube, mm -mm. no, everybody's saying that you can't see the replay on V Live. Oh well, you missed it. You missed it. It was fun. Uh, the it was very 70s. It was very. It was almost porn like. But Pablo says no, this is not porn. So he he's the expert. He said it's not porn. So it's fine. It it was pretty cool. There was a moment in it that had uh, the um like that my milk act it was very similar to it. it had like milk everywhere it was really cool and uh yeah so yeah here we are we don't have much of this chapter left this is the last of europe 1600 to 1700 and we it's probably going to be really really short because from what i gathered from the material it was only a few things and the chapter is France and England and England only had like one guy so uh, yeah um yeah no worries Jay no worries welcome everybody Mr. Wordsworth hi hi the Johnny boy he's saying look at the beautiful chat that's right the chat is always really amazing we have really interesting intelligent chat members I love you guys you guys are always really great uh contribute a lot to the conversation and all that stuff hail the beautiful chat look at you all <laughs> okay yeah yes yes well the thing is if the stream is too short 
maybe I'll take up finishing my painting. Let me bring my painting up. I was painting my hometown in the Hudson Valley, New York, and uh, I was working with some acrylic doing this baby, and I'm not done because I have a lot to work on here. Uh, got a lot to work on in this field and the foreground trees. It's just a blob of brown right now, so I have some foreground stuff to do. There's also a bridge right here that I need to paint in and uh, any other details and what have you. So just doing a little scenic painting. Maybe, maybe we'll do that if the stream is incredibly short. <clears throat> but while I paint, I don't, I don't know. I feel like we got to watch something. And I just want to be careful with uh, the YouTube because I want to put this on YouTube. But anyway, that reminds me. Thank you guys for the diamonds and the lemons and the ninja kinis and all that stuff. It's really, really great. It's going to be a fun bonus in a few months when I cash that out. But in the meantime, it would really help me out. doesn't matter what platform you're on, DLive, YouTube, wherever you're watching this, it always really helps me out if you go to streamlabs.com slash TV. That's uh, the best way to do it because the money comes into my PayPal right away instead of taking a month or two with AdSense and then they take a third of it. YouTube takes a third. YouTube is really pissing me off lately. So yeah, I would really recommend doing Streamlabs if you want to contribute and you want to help and you're just really enjoying what I do here. Thanks, Jay. It says it looks great so far, my painting. Thank you. And also, just so you guys know, I hope you join us, but on the 14th, March 14th, I will be having Michael Graves from the former frontman uh, singer of The Misfits uh, on the show. So we'll be doing an interview. I think he's going to be doing a live performance. I have to make sure that all my tech and sound and everything is all sorted for that to happen. But that's really exciting. Uh, I have a friend of mine who, let me turn this, how's the volume? Is it all right? Is this better? I think it's better when I like hold it, right? Hello, 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 hello. Nope, that's better up here. I think that's better. Uh, my levels are, oop, my levels are looking a little low, that's why. But yeah, so uh, a friend of mine knows him and did a documentary, Paul Pazil. Uh I should remember what the name of that documentary is. But yeah, uh, and so he connected back up with him recently and uh, was trying to get him on my show. And that's really fun because not only is he one of us, politically he's one of us, he's not a leftist by any means, uh, right winger all the way. But so he's, it's really cool. He's one of us. It's this whole artsy kind of thing that we're having on my channel and with you guys. You guys are all artsy people who are non leftists, non-SJWs. If you are a leftist, you're non-SJW left and you can mingle with the chat and, and it's, you guys are just amazing. So this is an opportunity for more people like that to come on my show and we get to just, you know, this is what the c -c culture is about. <clears throat> so we'll have more cultural people on. I'm also going to have at some point, I don't have a date yet, but a big fan of Lady Alchemy is Lloyd Kaufman. So the filmmaker, the trauma guy, and he did, uh, what is it, that famous one, the Toxic toxic Avenger, stuff like that. So that'll be fun. I think we'll have a little bit more of that kind of stuff going on. Yes, yes. Yeah. Cool. Oh, thank you for the link, Jay. Yeah, Jay is always posting the Streamlabs link. Thank you, thank you. It should be in the description as well. Okay, so let's get going. See what's going on. Let's see what do we have here. <laughs> One minute, guys. One minute. There we go. 
go. A little bit too big. This is what we're working with. Let me just double check real quick. Yeah, I wanna zoom it in a bit because it's hard for me to read. It's a little too zoomed in now. Just give me a second. Sorry, I thought I prepped all this, but you know, you know how it is. Never prepped enough. Never prepped enough. Okay, that should work. So, like I said, we are finishing off this is chapter on 1600 to <clears throat> 1700. It's the Baroque European artwork. And we're doing France and England today. There's really not much. So I'm gonna backtrack a little bit in case some of you guys missed it. I'm not gonna go too far, but let's do a quick little rundown and we'll do a rundown at the end as well. But You know, I think I'm going to read this because it, it'll give you the idea of what we're working with here if you missed it. So Europe, 1600 to 1700. During the 17th century, numerous geopolitical shifts occurred in Europe as the fortunes, uh, fortunes of the individual countries waxed and waned. Pronounced political and religious friction resulted in widespread unrest and warfare. Indeed, between 1562 and 1721, all of Europe was at peace for mere four years. The major conflict of this period was the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1638, which ensnared Spain, France, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, Germany, Austria, Poland, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. Again, remember, I was shot by Otto von Bismarck's descendant, like great great grandson or some shit like that. Great 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 grandson, something like that. I don't know. But yeah, uh, Count Nikolai von Bismarck. Although he shot me, as in he's a photographer nowadays dating Kate Moss. Um, although the outbreak of the war had its roots in the religious conflict between militant Catholics, militant Catholics, and militant Protestants. Oh my God, these militant Catholics and Protestants. The driving force quickly shifted to secular, dynastic, and nationalistic concerns. Among the major political entities vying for expanded power and authority of Europe were the Bourbon dynasty, Bourbon, Bourbon dynasty of the of France and the Habsburg dynasty of Spain and the Holy Roman Empire. The war, which concluded with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, was largely responsible for the political restructuring of Europe. As a result, the United Provinces of the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic, Sweden, and France expanded their authority. Spanish and Danish power diminished. In addition to reconfiguring territorial boundaries, the Treaty of Westphalia in essence granted freedom of religious choice throughout Europe. This treaty thus marked the abandonment of the idea of a united Christian Europe and recognized the practical realities of secular political systems. The building of today's nation states was emphatically under, underway. The 17th century also brought heightened economic competition to Europe. Much of the foundation for worldwide mercantilism, extensive geographic exploration, improved maps, advances in shipbuilding had been laid in the previous century. 
In the 17th century, however, changes in financial systems, lifestyles, and trading patterns, along with expanding colonialism, fueled the creation of a worldwide marketplace. The Dutch founded the Bank of Amsterdam in 1609, which eventually became the center of European transfer banking, by establishing a system in which merchants, mer merchant firms held money on account, the bank relieved traders of having to transport precious metals as payment. Trading practices became more complex. Rather than reciprocal trade, triangular trade, trade among three parties, allowed for a larger pool of desirable goods. Exposure to a wider array of goods affected European diets and lifestyles. Coffee from island colonies and tea from China became popular beverages during the 17th century. Equally explosive was the growth of sugar use. <sighs> you know, just reading that made me want to make a coffee. Oh God, I really want coffee and I love sugar too. Um, so equally explosive was the growth of sugar use. Sugar, tobacco, mm. Coffee, sugar, and tobacco? God damn, that sounds amazing right now. And rice were slave crops, and the slave trade expanded to meet the demand for these goods. The resulting worldwide mercantile system permanently changed the face of Europe. The prosperity international trade generated the prosperity international trade generated affected social and political relationships necessitating new rules of etiquette and careful diplomacy. Let's just look at this map real quick. With increased disposable income, more of the newly wealthy spent money on art, expanding the number of possible sources of patronage. We already went over this, and you know what I'm going to say about it. It's always the point that they make on the importance of art and the people funding the arts. So with more income, more disposable income, there was more patronage. There was more interest in, in having owning art. And usually it's like the emperors, kings, queens, the church. These are all these people that were benefactors of our patrons of the arts and saw the importance of the influence it can have on society. And this is what the whole Baroque period was about was... Uh, you know, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation and trying to tap into the hearts and minds of the people through art. And they created all these amazing things in churches and a lot of religious works to kind of tap into them. In church, when it was Latin Mass, not everyone spoke Latin or understood Latin. And there was Latin Mass was generally how Mass was. Um, if people couldn't read or write or anything... That's why they had all this artwork uh, in churches and stuff and those grand um, mantelpieces. And it was a way to get people kind of connecting with it if they couldn't understand or they couldn't read. Art historians traditionally describe 17th century European art as Baroque, but the term is problematic because the period encompasses a broad range of styles and genres. Although its original is... Although its origin is unclear, Baroque may have come from the Portuguese word Barocco, meaning an irregularly shaped pearl. Use of the term emerged in the late 18th and early 19th centuries when critics disparaged the Baroque period's artistic production, in large part because of perceived deficiencies in comparison with the art of the Italian Renaissance. Over time, this negative connotation faded, but the term is still useful to describe the distinctive new style that emerged during the 17th century, a style of complexity and drama seen especially in Italian art. Drama! I love it. Whereas Renaissance artists reveled in the precise, ordinary, uh, orderly rational, rationality of classical models, Italian Baroque artists embraced dynamicism, theatricality, and elaborate ornamentation. Love it. All used to spectacular effect, often on grandiose scale. So yeah, that's why we get into, I mean, the other streams on this are really long, but they're really fascinating. So uh, if you didn't see them, you should catch up because the architecture and sculpture, I mean, in Italy was fantastic with, uh, who did we start out with? Moderno, Moderno Carlo Moderno. 
and the Pope Paul V commissioned him to do uh, the facade of Saint, or to do Saint Peter's, not just the facade uh, at Vatican City. And then it got tossed about for uh, quite a bit of time. I think Bernini then finished it off, or or, or then he was maybe the middle guy that did it. Uh, so yeah, he worked on the new St. Peter's Vatican as well. Uh, yeah, Bernini, I mean, Bernini also did these amazing sculptures. We have Baldacchino. I mean, look at Bernini's sculptures here. Amazing. Let me just make sure you guys can see. Bahoko. Ah, oh, thank you for that. You, uh, the Portuguese is pronounced something. Yeah, by the way, in Portuguese, it's pronounced something like Bahoko. Yeah, thank you. I knew that I probably said that wrong. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you. Okay, sorry. Let me get back to it. Uh, we have David, Bernini's David, which is much different than Michelangelo's David. Uh, Bernini's Baroque David is about, uh, it, it's the dynamic movement. It's more on an angle as opposed to Michelangelo's David, which is up and down. Uh, Michelangelo's is also static, his David. It's very stationary. It's uh, just this calming moment. But Bernini's David is at an angle. It's emotional in the face it's it's that moment as he's flinging about to fling the the rock so yeah just different david style oh god i mean these are just stunning the bernini sculpture here at this church the uh, ecstasy of saint Teresa. i mean this is the moment of ecstasy of her like finding her faith or some shit or and uh See the angel puncturing her with this amazing life force. What do we have here? Cornaro Chapel. Oh, okay, we got this chapel over here. Okay, something that I remember about this chapel is from Romini. I just remember they kept saying undulating. They kept saying the word undulating, like undulating. Yeah, and there's two entrances. There's one on the side, I think, and there's one right here. And this is the inside bit. And uh, it's really cool because this light bit inside right here is because there's windows hidden inside there. So it brightens it up a bit. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so Bermini. Then we have the painting. Oh, yeah, they did all these really amazing ceiling paintings. Really cool. Uh, Karachi, I think is how you say it. I don't know how to say it. And this is really interesting. This is Giovanni Pietro Bellori on Caravaggio. So we'll get into Caravaggio, or we got into Caravaggio, um, and this is also another ecstasy, kind of like the ecstasy of St. Teresa, where this guy is like finding his, uh, yeah, what he used uh, perspective, chiaroscuro, dramatic lighting, to bring the viewer to the painting space. Uh, yeah, so this is his conversion, St. Paul's conversion to Christianity, where he finds that, that ecstasy, that glowing light. Very strange why there's a horse on top of him while it happens, but such it is. But this was a bit interesting, I felt. I might, you know what, just go ahead and read this as well, because this shows how back in the day, Caravaggio was actually like the anti-trad artist so he did things that were very muted very uh, real real life he liked the mundaneness of real life and tried to capture that that is what he found the essence of his artwork was about uh and it's almost ugly you know i don't i i love caravaggio i love his painting i love his chiaroscuro i love his chiaroscuro his uh, lighting, I, I mean, it's really, really amazing. But in contrast to the other really opulent kind of stuff and the, the obsession of perfectionism, which I, uh, I favor more, I, I do get that, that he was criticized a lot for 
uh, not being like the old masters. So it's really funny that you had some trad people being like, he's not trad enough. This is too modern and ugly. I hate it. So it's quite funny. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to read this a little bit. The written sources to which art historians turn as aids in understanding the art of the past are invaluable, but they reflect the personal preferences and prejudices of the writers. Giovanni Pietro Valori, 1613 to 1696. The leading biographer of Baroque artists was an outspoken admirer of Renaissance classicism, especially the art of Raphael and the ardent critic of mannerism and of Caravaggio. In his Vita of Annabel Caracci, for example, Bellori praises the divine Raphael, whose art raised its beauty to the summit, restoring it to the ancient majesty of the Greeks and the Romans. I love that. I'm all about perfection, beauty, admiration for, for something more perfect like the Greeks and Romans. Um, and he lamented that soon after, artists abandoning the study of nature corrupted art with the miniera, mini, mini, miniera? that is to say, with the fantastic idea based on practice and not imitation. Valori characterized Caravaggio as talented and widely imitated, but condemned him for his rejection of classicism in favor of realism. Two excerpts from Bellori's Vita of Caravaggio record some of the painter's own memorable remarks. Again, we've got this biographer of artists being like, mm, this is not trad. This is disgusting and embracing ugliness. That's what we talk about art today with the uh, contemporary art. We're just like, look at them embracing the ugly. Can we get back to beauty and the classics, please? So anyway, he writes about Caravaggio that Caravaggio began to paint according to his own inclinations, not only ignoring, but even despising the superb statuary of antiquity and the famous paintings of Raphael. He considered nature to be the only subject fit for his brush. As a result, when he was shown the most famous statues of the ancient Greek masters, Phidias and Glycon, in order that he might use them as models, his only answer was to point toward the crowd of people, saying that nature had given him an abundance of masters. When he came upon someone in town who pleased him, he made no attempt to improve on the creations of nature. Caravaggio claimed that he imitated his model so closely that he never made a single brushstroke that he called his own, but said rather that it was nature's. Repudiating all other rules, he considered the highest achievement not to be found not to be bound to art. For this innovation, he was greatly acclaimed, and many talented and educated artists seemed compelled to follow him. Nevertheless, he lacked invenzione, invenzione, decorum, designo, or any knowledge of science of painting. The moment the model was taken away from him, his hands and his mind became empty. With Caravaggio began the imitation of common and vulgar things, seeking out filth and deformity. There you go. So this shows you how they viewed Caravaggio, or he viewed Caravaggio as the modernist artist that was, uh, liked the vulgar things, the common and vulgar things, seeking out filth and deformity. Interesting stuff. Love it. And then they have, yeah, this is another Caravaggio, the conversion, uh, no, calling of St. Matthew. So they're counting money there or something. And Jesus is there. So you can see, instead of all the gold and glamour and like, ah, oh, regalness of the other Baroque art, this is just like a plain mundane kind of uh, wall. This is supposed to be Jesus right here. So they didn't, yeah, he did it very, very basic. And then we have the letters of Artemisia, who is, as you can see with her chiaros chiaroscuro and the lighting and all that was definitely influenced by Caravaggio. Um, but she had a little bit of a feminist uh, hint, angle to her artwork. She was definitely very bitter. Uh, I'm gonna read this as well. I'm just gonna, I like reading these little side things. Okay. 
Just checking in on you guys. So here we have Artemisia. I don't know. I don't like saying her last name. Don't know how to say it. She was the most renowned woman painter in Europe during the first half of the 17th century. Oop. And the first woman ever admitted to membership in Florence's Accademia del Desegno. In addition to scores of paintings created for wealthy patrons that included the King of England and the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Artemisia left behind 28 letters, some of which reveal that she believed patrons treated her differently because of her gender. Two 1649 letters written in Naples to Don Antonio Rufo in Messina makes, make her feelings explicit. Yeah, I mean, I think back in these times, too, I remember my art teacher in high school talking about how in order to get entry into school, they did stuff that was like drawing a male nude and stuff, so you couldn't really see a men's, men's genitalia and stuff unless he was like your husband. It was like heresy. You weren't allowed to do that kind of thing. So it kept women out of art schools and stuff, but she, uh, she figured out ways to do it and get into school and, and, and to make a career out of it. And I also do want to be clear. I mean, we're talking, what is it? 16? Yeah. 1600s. So, uh, 1600 to 700. So uh, yeah, the shit happens today. It happens with me. I'm not going to deny it. I've never really been a feminist by any means uh, in the traditional sense. But yeah, I'm not going to deny it. Certainly in this time, it must have been very difficult as a woman to be a professional artist and be taken seriously. And so anyway, here are an, here's an excerpt of her letters. I fear that before you saw the painting, you must have thought me arrogant and presumptuous. If it were not for your most il illustrious lordship, I would not have been in induced induced to give it... Sorry. It's hard to read this old-timey shit sometimes. If it were not for your most illustrious lordship, I would not have been induced to give it for 160, because everywhere else I have been, I was paid 100 scooty per figure. You think me pitiful because a woman's name raises doubts until her work is seen. Um, as for my doing a drawing and sending it, tell the, tell the gentleman who wishes to know the price for painting that I have made a solemn vow never to send my drawings because people have cheated me. In particular, just today, I found myself in the situation that Ha having done a drawing of souls in purgatory for the Bishop of St. Gatta, he, in order to spend less, commissioned another painter to do the painting using my work. If I were a man, I can't imagine it would have turned out this way, because when the concept has been realized and defined with lights and darks and established by means of planes, the rest is trifle. So, wow, that is uh, pretty crazy. And it was even a bishop, it's supposed to be a religious person who kind of was like, yeah, yeah, give me your sketches, bitch. And then like, okay, ran off to get a cheaper deal with some other artist with her sketches. Man, it's crazy. All right, and then we have this ceiling, which is amazing because it just like blasts you right into heaven, right through the church. Cool, cool. And then we got Spain. Um, yeah, more religious figures. All religious, religious. And then we have this famous one. Velasquez. Las Veninas. Yep, yep. We got Flanders. Okay, this is more religious stuff. Peter Paul Rubens. Rubens is amazing too. I love his compositions. Uh, everyone's falling into place. I love it. I love it. Jesus is falling. Everyone's undulating. This is another Peter Paul Rubens. It's amazing. He was uh, very tight-knit with royal people. This is the arrival of Marie, uh, the Medici. Yeah, yeah. This is the Medici lady arrival to France, hence this, like, French guy and, you know, stuff, and everybody's cheering and all, all the uh, mythological figures are cheering and the angels are blowing their trumpets because she arrived. Uh, oh, we got the Dutch Republic, which was really fantastic for the Baroque era. Um, wait, 
yeah, I, I guess it's a Dutch painter, but this is King Charles of England. Um, this uh, dismounted, and uh, I said the name of the river wrong last time. It's the Thames, the Thames River. Jack was also laughing at how I said it, so I think it's the Thames. So I'm overlooking the Thames River. King Charles in his hipster hat and his hipster beard. Just being all hipster there. That ah sound you do needs to be a donation sound. That's so true. That's so true. I love it. That's funny. Okay. Oh, well, we got these Dutch guys. All these old guys. Various poses and hipster hats and beards and mustaches. This is another chick. She's a chick showing her kind of uh, status because she's in fancy clothes and she's painted herself painting. It's very meta, very meta. This one's great. This is uh, Rembrandt. And this is the known as the Night Watch. And uh, this painting was actually chopped up, but it still gives the importance of uh, what's going on here. This is a portrait, self-portrait of Rembrandt. Very nice. You can see where the light's coming from, from the upper left side here. He was also known for his lighting and kid is cute, though. This is also Rembrandt's uh, print. It's an etching. And it's at uh, the J. Pierpont Library in, or Pierpont Morgan Library in New York. It's J. P. Morgan Chase, same difference. But yeah, it's an etching by Rembrandt. Cool. And then we get into, oh yeah, this is, uh, oh, it's very, so, well, it's like my, it's like my painting. That one's so much better, <laughs> I have to say. But uh, yeah, I, it, they talked about how it had a lot of sky in this painting. It had a lot of sky and I was like, yeah, I kind of like that concept of a lot of sky and the this the land is really tiny and set back but i particularly like uh landscapes like that in fact my landscape painting is from a picture that i actually took from a tower so that's why it looks like that but i i do like all this big sky i think painting skies is really awesome and i'm sorry to the dutch because like i know that the dutch new york has Dutch influences because that's where they settled here. But um, Hudson Valley's better. New York's better. Look at the mountains. You guys don't have these mountains. Look how flat this shit is. So flat. Okay, yeah. And then we have the art of painting. We've got Vermeer. Everybody knows Vermeer. We don't have the uh, Girl with the Pearl earrings going on in this book at all. Um, perhaps something we could look into if we finish too early. But I think I'm catching up with the chapter, so it's okay. I have making some time but wow yeah i think he used some sort of optics some like optical illusion like a projector ancient projector type to get really realistic look which it really does look like a photograph it's pretty amazing you'd think this is like a photograph like look at the tapestry how it has the little creases and everything in, t in it it's really cool Vermeer used both mirrors and the camera obscura to depict opulent 17th century Dutch domestic interiors so convincingly. He was also far ahead of his time in understanding the science of color. That chandelier looks like a painting. It's incredible. Thames. Okay, it's the Thames River. Sorry about that, Mr. Wordsworth, thank you, Thames, the Thames, 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 not the Thames, 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 it's the Thames. Check out the floor, yeah, let's look back at it. I mean, look at that, look at the little detailing going on, god damn. And then I look at my fucking painting, it looks like a child painted it, it's ridiculous. It's amazing, it's great, and the 
yeah. <clears throat> then we get the still lives. Still lives? Still lives. Uh, I love a good still life. That's probably be my next painting. Love a good still life. But yeah, you can see the artist in the uh, orb here. And this had a lot of symbolisms of death. And I would say life and death. I mean, symbolisms of death is also a symbolism of life. Uh, hence the skull, the timepiece, a glass tipped over, this like walnut, I think it is. And then this was also a female artist as well. Uh, and she comes from a, like a florist family. So she particularly does extremely detailed flowers and it is, it is quite lovely. And the composition of this is interesting because it, it kind of goes bottom left here to upper right here. It's really lovely. All right, now we got France. Now we're getting into it, guys. Let's get into it. France. In France, monar monarchical, monarchical, monarchical. Monarchical. Is that how you say it? Monarchical. I should ask Jack, the someone that has a monarch. How do you say that? Monarchical? Anyway, the monarch had authority, uh, authority had been increasing for centuries, culminate, cul culminating in the reign of Louis XIV, roughly 1661 to 1715, who sought to determine the direction of France. French society and culture. Okay, let me read that again. In France, the monarchy, the authority, had been increasing for centuries, culminating in the reign, sorry, I have a hard time saying that word, culminating in the reign of Louis XIV, who sought to determine the direction of French society and culture. Although its economy was not as expansive as that of the Dutch Republic, France became Europe's largest and most powerful country in the 17th century. Against this backdrop, the artist flourished. Again, so when you have finances are flourishing, you have artwork that flourishes. Art and patronage and, and I mean, that's culture, you know, it's culture. So if you want a fabulous enriched nation, artwork follows. Then we have Nicholas Poussin. I'm going to say that unless somebody corrects me. Poussin. Rome's ancient and Renaissance monuments entice many French artists to study there. For example, Normandy-born Nicholas Poussin, 1594 to 1665, spent most of his life in Rome, where he produced grandly severe paintings modeled on those of Titan and Raphael. Ooh. He also carefully worked out a theoretical explanation of this method and was ultimately responsible for establishing classical painting as an important ingredient of the 17th century French art. See Poussin's note for a treatise on painting. Poussin's classical style presents a striking contrast to the contemporaneous Baroque style of his Italian counterparts in Rome, underscoring the multifaceted character of the art of 17th century Europe. Poussin's et in Arcadia ego, even in Arcadio I am present, 1029, this one. Very nice. Yeah, I see the Raphael inspiration. Yeah, for sure. Here? No, we're doing this in here. Okay, so in this thing, he draws on the rational order and stability. Oh, let me bring it up for you guys while I read. My bad. happening why isn't it showing oh i think i have to have it up that's why mm. 
Sorry, I just got a news update. We got Cuomo accuser opens up in powerful new interview. Oh, God. You know, we got both sides just being hypocrites right now because, I mean, I'm from New York, so, I mean, I get it. Cuomo fucking sucks. But it's like, yes, vindicated because we have the, um, what was it with the Supreme Court guy? Which, what's his name? The guy that they were accused doing the Me Too shit, the super Supreme Court guy. And, um, I forget his fucking name. But, um, yeah, and the left are like, believe all women. So now it's interesting how they're acting this time around. But the right has to be careful because we, we can't, you know, we can't do the same shit and be hypocritical and then just start believing this chick no matter what when we, we're all like, you can't believe all women. We need evidence. Due process, due process. So I get it. I get it. Due process and all. And I get that, you know, fuck Cuomo and all that shit. But... Uh, yeah, just, uh, let the left kind of deal with the bed they made. Let them lay in it. You know what I mean? Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thank you, Kavanaugh. Hey, Steven, it's you. Nice to see you in here. Cool. All right. Uh, sorry, let me just check in on you guys here, and let me get this art capture going. Why didn't it work? Why didn't it work? Is it, like, tiny? Is that what's happening? Oh, my God. I had everything all set up for you guys, and now it's not working. Hold on. Come on, photos work. Let me just try to open it again. There we go. It's working. Great. All right. You look at that while I read. So this is <clears throat> Nicholas Poussin's Even in Arcadia, I Am Present. Drawings on the rational order and stability of Raphael's paintings and on antique statuary landscape of which Poussin became increasingly fond provides the setting for this picture dominating the foreground however are three shepherds living in the idyllic land of Arcadia who study an inscription on a tomb as a statuesque female figure quietly places her hand on the shoulder of one of them she may be the spirit of death reminding these mortals as does the inscription that death is found even in Arcadia supposedly a spot of Paris paradise parad paradisal bliss the countless draped female statues surviving in Italy and Rome Roman times supplied the models for this figure and the posture of the youth with the one foot resting on a boulder derives from Greco-Roman statues of Neptune the sea god leaning on his trident let me see hmm okay interesting because in my comic book I have something like that where an archangel is kind of putting their hands on my shoulder for a second or Lady Alchemy's shoulder the countless draped female statues surviving in Italy from Roman times supplied the models for this figure and the posture of the youth with one foot resting on a boulder derives from Greco-Roman statues of Neptune the sea god leaning on his trident the classically compact, balanced grouping of the figures, the even light, and the thoughtful and reserved mood complement Poussin's classical figure types. Cool. And now there is this Poussin's notes for a treatise on painting. Actually, before I get into that, let me just remind you of what you're looking at here. This is... Uh, Circa 1655, it is oil on canvas, 2 feet 10 inches by 4 feet, and it's at the Louvre in Paris. 
Kusin was the leading proponent of classicism in Baroque Rome. His works incorporate the rational order and stability of Raphael's compositions, as well as figures inspired by ancient statuary. Okay, so to his treaties, treaties, treaties. As the leading exponent of classical painting in 17th century Rome, Nicholas Poussin outlined the principles of classicism in notes uh, for an intended treatise on painting left incomplete at his death. Damn. In those notes, Poussin described the essential ingredients necessary to produce beautiful paintings in the grand manner. Oh, that's the opposite of Caravaggio. The grand manner consists of four things, subject matter or theme, thought, structure, and style. Remember, we went over the uh, definition of style uh, for in, in this textbook. So style has like kind of like a two, two things to it, but yeah, style, you know, a style. The first thing that, as the fountain of all others, is required is that the subject matter shall be grand, as are battles, heroic actions, and divine things. Oh, I love that. But assuming that the subject on which the painter is laboring is grand, his next consideration is to keep away from minutia and painting only things magnificent and grand. Those who elect mean... Those who elect mean subjects take refuge in them because of the weakness of their talents. Hmm. True, true, true. Hence why I just drew a landscape in my hometown. The idea of beauty does not descend into matter unless it is prepared as carefully as possible. Ooh, I love that. The idea of beauty does not descend into matter unless this is prepared as carefully as possible. This preparation consists of three things, arrangement, measure, and aspect or form. Arrangement means the relative position of the parts. Measure refers to their size, and form consists of lines and colors. Arrangement and relative position of the parts, sorry, I'm zooming it in. Arrangement and relative position of the parts and making every limb of the body hold its natural place are not sufficient unless measure is added, which gives each limb its correct size proportion, proportionate to that of the whole body. Compare Polytechno to the canon uh, on page 67. So yeah, Polyclatos, uh, his, he was also a master. He was the one that did the sculpture in like ancient Gre Greek, Greece, in ancient Greece. And he was the one that was like obsessed with calculating the perfect mathematical uh, proportions. He was all about mathematical proportions, which, you know, math and art. See, people are like, how do math and art come together? Well, hello. Okay, so let me finish reading this sentence. I cut that off. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Arrangement and relative position of the parts and making every limb of the body hold its natural place are not sufficient unless measure is added, which gives to each limb its correct size, proportionate to that of the whole body, and unless a form joins in so that the lines will be drawn with grace and with harmonious juxtaposition of light and shadow. Okay. Let me just check in on you guys. Poussin? Okay, Poussin. But you know what? We're done talking about him. We are done talking about him. Thank you, though. On to the next one, shall we? change this for you. There we go. All right, guys, don't forget, if you are watching and enjoying yourself and you appreciate what I'm doing uh, and you have it to give, I would really appreciate it if you go to streamlabs.com slash TV. Thank you, thank you. It would help contribute to my goal. 
so now we have Claude Lorraine. I think I'm saying that one right. Right, guys? <laughs> that one I'm saying right. We're still in France here. So we have Claude oh, Gillet, Gillet, called Claude Lorraine, 1600 to 1682, after his birthplace in the Duchy of Lorraine, rivaled Poussin in fame. Okay. Claude modulated in a softer style, the disciplined, rational art of Poussin. Unlike the figures in Poussin's pictures, those in Claude's landscape tell no dramatic story, point out no moral, and praise no hero. Indeed, his figures often appear to be added as mere excuses for the radiant landscape itself. Aww. For Claude, painting involved essentially one theme, the beauty of a broad sky suffused with the golden light of dawn or sunset glowing through a hazy atmosphere and reflecting brilliantly off the rippling water. Love that. So that brings us to his painting in landscape with cattle and peasants. Let's see what that looks like. Mm -mm -mm. Hold on a second. No. No, come on, work, work, work. Why is it not working? Damn it. This is so weird. Why won't it work? This is so weird. Why won't it work? Come on, photos. Maybe I'll exit out and try it again. <sighs> God. There it is. Okay, there it is. All right, I love it, I love it. So again, in this landscape uh, with cattle and peasants, the figures in the right foreground chat in animated fashion. In the left foreground, cattle relax contentedly. In the middle ground, cattle amble slowly away. The well-defined foreground, distinct middle ground, and dim background recede in serene order, order, order lines orderliness. <laughs> I can't read. The well-defined foreground, distinct middle ground, and dim background recede in serene orderliness until all form dissolves in a luminous mist. Love that. Let me just look at it again. Yeah, I love that. See, this reminds me of the Hudson River School of Art. That's why I love painting and looking at the Hudson Valley. So we have the foreground cattle, we got people, we got the little cattle in the back. Look at them cows. The little tiny cows over here. Aw. Oh, look at these guys. And then it just like dissipates. I love it. Yeah, I love it. See, I love mountains and scenery like that, greenery. Oh. To reading. <clears throat> so this is Claude Lorraine, landscape with cattle and peasants, 1629. It is oil on canvas, three feet six inches by four feet ten and a half inches, and it's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art in Philadelphia. Claude used atmospheric and linear, linear perspective to transform the rustic Roman countryside filled with peasants and animals into an ideal classical landscape bathed in sunlight in infinite space. Uh, so, mm -mm. 
Claude's formalizing of nature with balanced groups of architectural masses, screens of trees, and sheets of water followed the great tradition of classical landscape. It began with the backgrounds of Venetian paintings and continued in the art of Poussin. Poussin? Yet Claude, like the Dutch painters, studied the light and the atmospheric nuances of nature, making a unique contribution. He reordered carefully in hundreds reordered i'm sorry i can't read right now he recorded i feel like i'm better reading when i'm drinking <laughs> oddly enough he recorded carefully in hundreds of sketches the look of the roman countryside its gentle terrain ascended ascended by stone pines cypresses and poplars 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 and by ever-present ruins of ancient aqueducts, tombs, and towers. He made these the fundamental elements of his compositions. The artist achieved his marvelous effect of light by painstakingly placing tiny value gradations, which limited, though on a very small scale, the true range of values of outdoor light and shade. Avoiding the problem of high noon sunlight overhead, Claude preferred and convincingly represented the sun's rays as they gradually illuminated the morning sky or with their dying glow, yet the pensive mood of evening. Thus, he matched the moods of nature with those of human subjects. Claude's infusion of nature with human feelings and his recomposition of nature in a calm equilibrium greatly appealed to the landscape painters of the 18th and early 19th centuries like probably the Hudson River School of Artists, School of Art Artists. Cool. Very cool. Look at these guys, get a load of them, right? Okay, I'll have you guys read along with me again. Hopefully my thing is behaving. I don't know why it's not behaving. Oh, interesting, interesting. Okay, I think I sorted it out. Oh, sorry, I gotta stretch it out, guys. Well, leaning forward to read is not ideal. Not ideal. So, yeah, again, we're dealing with France here. So, look at this guy. I mean,. I kind of love it. Look at his tiny little feet. And his socks. I love the sword and the cape. I'm all about it. So Louis the Fourteenth, The preeminent French art patron of the 17th century was King Louis the Fourteenth. Again, again guys, you know what I'm going to say. Look at the importance of art. The people that understood the importance of art were always kings, queens, you know, important influential people like the Medicis, uh, emperors, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, Holy Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church, uh, popes, all of these people, uh, they understood the importance of art. Um, yeah. And they're always patrons of it. So the preeminent French art patron of the 17th century was King Louis XIV, determined to consolidate and expand his power. Louis, Louis was a master of political strategy and propaganda. Again, most of these people, even the emperors and all sorts of these people, they understood the importance of art to, and the church to influence people and perspective propaganda so the right needs to get a fucking hint 
and start understanding the importance of art and how that can influence. I got to stop bitching about the culture war, the culture war, culture war all day long. Yet when it comes to the arts, we're like, oh, it's a leftist thing. Anyway, he established a carefully crafted and nuanced relationship with the nobility, granting them sufficient benefits to keep them pacified, but simultaneously maintaining rigorous control to forestall insurrection or rebellion. He also ensued subservience by anchoring his rule in divine rights, belief in a king's absolute power as being God's will. So... So convinced was Louis of his importance and centrality to the French kingdom that he eagerly adopted the title the Sun King. Wow, cool. Like the sun, Louis was the center of the universe and his desire for control extended to all realms of French life, including art. The king and his principal advisor, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, 1619 to 1683, strove to organize art and architecture in the service of the state. Interesting. They understood well the power of art as propaganda and the value of visual imagery for cultivating a public persona. And they spared no pains to raise great symbols and monuments to the king's absolute power. Louis and Colbert sought to, regular, to regularize taste and establish the classical style as the preferred French manner. The founding of the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture in 1648 served to advance this goal. I mean, wow. Wow, that is really fucking something to think about for a minute. Yeah. They communicated through art and symbolism still do exactly right like wow the importance of art and propaganda and public opinion i mean i feel like i want to read that sentence again real quick so louis was the center of the universe and his desire to control extended to all realms of life including art the king and his principal advisor, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, strove to organize art and architecture in the service of the state. They understood well the power of art as propaganda and the value of visual imagery for cultivating a public persona. And they spared no pains to raise great symbols and monuments to the king's absolute power. Louis and Colbert sought to regularize taste and establish the classical style as the preferred French manner. The founding of the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture in 1648 served to advance this goal. The portrait of Louis XIV by Hyacinth Rigaud. Okay, I don't know. Let me bring it up for you guys. Nope, not that one. There you go. Sorted out my issue, I think. There you go. Let's look at some of the detailing real quick. Look at his stank face. He's like, mm. That little dip in the hair is interesting. Love the fabric. Yes, yes, yes. Love the cane. Oh, scepter. I love the scepter. And the sword, oh, and this fabric, and the chair, oh, and the crown. Oh, how cool. It's pretty big, too. You see the one foot mark right here. Really cool. Oh my God, did I, I want to make sure, did I fuck up the D live and I, okay, no, I didn't do mature audiences. Okay, cool. Phew. Hey guys, what's going on? Yes. Art history class. That's what's happening. The tights are a bit weird. That's why he's making that stank face. Okay. Let me get back to it. So yeah, this is by Hyacinth Rigaud, 1659 to 1743, uh, Louis the Fourteenth. It's 1701. This painting. It's oil on canvas. 
nine feet two inches by six feet three inches and it's at the Louvre in Paris and this portrait set against a stately backdrop where God I have to I have to look up how to say that name isn't Hyacinth a girl's name is that a girl to pro pronounce names.com pronounce names.com rigo rigo okay R rago rigo 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 i'm not doing that rigo Okay. Do we have the correct pronunciation of your name? Pronouncenames.com. I love doing her voice. <laughs> Pronouncenames.com. Rico. In this portrait set against a stately backdrop, Rigu portrayed the five foot four inch sun king wearing red high heeled shoes with his ermine lined coronation robes thrown over his left shoulder wow he was five four they always talk about napoleon but napoleon was like five seven this guy was five four but they made a nine foot two inch painting of him wearing high heeled shoes Wow. Okay. So, Riku uh, successfully conveys the image of an absolute monarch. The king, age 63, when Rigaud painted this work, looks out at the viewer with directness. He stands with his left hand on his hip and with his elegant ermine, ermine lined fleur de lis coronation robes thrown over his shoulder, suggesting an air of haughtiness. Haughtiness. Louis also draws back his garment to expose his leg. Oh my God, he's like a burlesque dancer. Aww. The king was a ballet dancer in his youth and was proud of his well-toned legs. <laughs> I can't with this. I can't. He stands with his left hand on his hip with his elegant Fleur de Lis coronation robe thrown over his shoulder, suggesting an air of haughtiness. Louis also draws back his garment to expose his leg. The king was a ballet dancer in his youth and was proud of his well-toned legs. The portrait's majesty derives in large part from the composition. The sun king is the unmistakable focal point of the image and Regu, uh, placed him so that he seems to look down on the viewer. Given that Louis the Fourteenth was only five foot four inches tall, five feet four inches tall, a fact that drove him to invent the high-heeled shoe, <clears throat> to invent the high-heeled shoes he wears in the portrait, the artist apparently catered to his patron's wishes. The carefully detailed environment in which the king stands also contributes to the painting's stateliness and grand grandio grandiosity. Indeed, when the king was not present, Trigu portraits uh, his portraits, which hung over the throne, served in his palace, served in his place, and courtiers were not permitted to turn their backs on the painting. Damn, that's crazy. <laughs> Critique said, don't matter about the noodle arms, check out my calves. <laughs> oh my god. It's an old English thing in all Magnus. Those days people have nice bodies, not just calves. These days people try to have nice bodies, not just calves. King Twinkle Toes. I love it.
Pronouncenames.com. I'm just reading your captions. Just call him Ragu. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Continue reading about this guy. Well, let me bring you to where I'm at. So now we have Versailles. Louis XIV was also a builder on a grand scale. One of his projects was to convert a royal hunting lodge at Versailles, a few miles outside Paris, into a great palace. He assembled a veritable army of architects, decorators, sculptors, painters, and landscape architects under the general management of Charles Le Brun. Okay, so this takes me full circle, guys, full circle to the etiquette streams, which we have not done in quite a few months, but should get back to that. Um, because if you look at my very first on my YouTube channel, if you go to youtube.com slash Martina Marcotti TV, you will see a playlist of etiquette videos. And like my very first etiquette video, I talk about where etiquette comes from. And the story is, is that Louis the 14th, when he was, you know, had his, um, the, the palace of Versailles and all this and the landscape artist uh, architect who was uh, a Scotsman he was getting really irritated because his courtiers kept like trampling over the lawn and so he kept complaining to the king and the king I don't know had him put out these signs or something that was uh, you'll notice the little tickets uh, etiquette means tickets etiquette uh, and there's like these little tickets etiquettes on the lawn and sometimes you still see them where it says keep off the grass and that's the start of etiquette was trying to keep his courtiers in line and, and behave a certain way uh, you know because he told them to but yeah very little interesting lesson on etiquette you guys should check it out Jay if you could find that video that'd be great just throw it in the, throw it in the chat for others that maybe aren't familiar with who I am or what I do um, check that out it's really fun our etiquette streams are pretty fun too Always learning some new words and whatnot. Anyway, so so yeah, the under the general management of Charles Le Brun, 1619 to 1690, in their hands, the convention of a excuse me, the conversion of a simple lodge into the Palace of Versailles became the greatest architectural project of the age, a defining statement of French Baroque style and an undeniable symbol of Louis XIV's power and ambition. Let's check it out. I know. Let me find it. Okay. go do a little zoom in action the court the uh, lawn here's the court okay 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 I mean I guess Streamlabs link. Yeah, it's streamlabs.com slash Martina Marcota TV. Thank you, Jay, for adding the etiquette playlist. Thank you, thank you. All right, I'm going to read. So this is Jules Har Harduin Mansart, Charles Lebrun, and André Lenorte. Lenort. Aerial view looking west of the Palace and Gardens of Versailles, France, begun 1669. Louis XIV ordered his architects to convert a royal hunting lodge at Versailles into a gigantic palace and park with a uh, state light city. Sorry, state light. 
My God, sometimes I read things so retardedly. I think it's satellite. I read it as state. I just saw the word state and light. State light. Satellite. I swear, my husband thinks I'm dyslexic because <laughs> it's become a joke. Like, I, uh, I, I see things and I my brain registers like sees all the letters and they it registers things the wrong way and so it's become a joke of mine with him to point to something <laughs> and just say the absolute like wrong thing but it like resembles it and it's just like it's just become a joke like oh i'll look at something and, and i don't know i need to find an example of it but <laughs> I just say the wrong thing purposefully now, but like my brain, like that's how it first registers in my brain. And I point and go, oh, that's like whatever. Like I'll, something will be like the wool pack or something, like a bar called the wool pack. And I'll, and I'll call it the wolf pack. Like that's what I call it. It's the wolf pack. Cause I read it as wolf pack. <laughs> and we just joke about that. I don't know. It's various things. It's really funny. But anyway, so this is Louis XIV that ordered his architects to convert a royal hunting lodge at Versailles into a gigantic palace and park with a satellite city whose three radial avenues intersect in the king's bedroom. What? Holy shit. Okay, that's pretty crazy. That's pretty fucking crazy. I dig. Hmm. Yeah, some critique said, I thought etiquette was about having manners or something like that. I never knew it was this. Yeah, uh, the etiquette streams are really interesting. I go over Emily Post, who is the leading author on etiquette in America. But uh, yeah, the original term for etiquette came from the Palace of Versailles with King Louis the Fourteenth, who whose gardener landscape guy was some Scotsman who was like really annoyed because courtiers kept stamping, tramping over uh, the lawn and they wrote tickets out saying, uh, keep, keep within the etiquette, keep, you know, what is it? Keep off the grass, basically keep within the etiquettes. And uh, that's where it started. And then it started to turn into various forms of how to, engage with each other in a way of, um, you know, having respect for each other. That's kind of what it's about. And people confuse etiquette for being something that's like hoity toity and like, Ooh, you have to like be this way and act a certain way and say the right thing. And otherwise you're low class. That's not what etiquette is about. It's just, it's about understanding social cues. And, uh, I, I did a video too about, um, I think it's like the second or third video maybe. Uh, maybe actually the first first video was about this, but it's um, about how uh, the left want to create like a social, you know, the SJW stuff, the social justice warriors. They want to kind of control people's thoughts and actions and writings and thoughts and feelings and everything and words. But we already have a mechanism in place for social cohesion and it is called etiquette. Okay. It's called etiquette. Yeah. Social cohesion, guys. Etiquette. We already have it. We don't need these SJW shit. Okay. Let's get back in to uh, Louis the Fourteenth and the Palace of Versailles. So it became a great project. Planned on a gigantic scale, the project called not only for a large palace flanking a vast park, but also for the construction of a satellite city to house court and government officials, military and guard detachments, courtiers and servants, undoubtedly to keep them all under the king's close supervision. Lebrun laid out this town to the east of the palace along three radial avenues that converge on the palace structure. There are axes, axes in a symbolic assertion of the ruler's absolute power over, the, over his domains intersected in the king's spacious bedroom, which also served as an official audience chamber. Huh. The palace itself, more than a quarter mile long, is 
pre uh, is perpendicular to the dominant east-west axis that runs through the associated city and park. Every detail of the extremely rich decoration of the palace's interior received careful attention. The architects and decorators designed everything from wall paintings to doorknobs in order to reinforce the splendor of Versailles and to exhibit the very finest sense of art artisanship, art art artisanship? Of the literally hundreds of rooms within the palace, the most famous is the Galerie de Glaces, Glaces, or Hall of Mirrors. Oh, cool! Designed by Jules Hardin Mansart. Let's look at that. Hall of Mirrors, cool. Hold on a second, guys. I'll get you seeing it in a minute. Can you see that? All right, cool. Let's check this out. Fascinating. Cool ceiling. Cool chandeliers. Okay, so it's just like a hallway with mirrors as walls, I guess. Oh, cool. I dig. Okay, so it's designed by that Jules guy and Lebrun, the Lebrun guy. This hall overlooks the park from the second floor and extends along most of the width of the central block. Although deprived of its original sumptuous furniture, which included gold and silver chairs and bejeweled trees, the Hall of Mirrors retains much of its splendor today. Damn, I want, I want to see that furniture in there. Sumptuous furniture. Gold and silver chairs and bejeweled trees. Cool. Hundreds of mirrors set into the wall opposite the windows alleviate the hall's tunnel-like quality and illusionistically extend the width of the room. The mirror, well, that's what mirrors do. The mirror, that ultimate source of illusion, was a favorite element of Baroque interior design. Here, it also enhanced the dazzling extravagance of the great fest festivals Louis the 14th was also fond of hosting the enormous palace might appear unbearably ostentatious where it is not for its uh, were it not for its extraordinary setting in the vast park that make it almost an adjunct from the gallery of mirrors the hall of mirrors the king and his guests could gaze out a sweeping vista ga gaze out on a sweeping vista down the park's tree-lined central axis and across terraces cool so this is jules harduin mansart and charles lebrun gallery de glaces hall of mirrors palace of versailles and versailles france circa 1680 this hall overlooks the Versailles Park from the second floor of Louis XIV's palace. Hundreds of mirrors illusionistically extended the room's width and once reflected gilded and bejeweled furnishings. Damn. I want to see those furnishings. Oh my god, I always do this. Whenever I'm like switching pages, I always feel like the sentence ends at that page but it actually extends so let me finish reading this okay so the enormous palace might appear unbearably ostentatious were it not for its extraordinary setting and the vast park that makes it almost an adjunct from the hall of mirrors the king and his guests could gaze out on a sweeping vista down the park's tree-lined central access and across terraces lawns pools and lakes toward the horizon. The Park of Versailles, designed by André Lenort, uh, 1613 to 1700, must rank among the world's greatest artworks in both size and concept. Here, the French architect transformed an entire forest into a park. Although the geometric plan may appear stiff and formal, the park, in fact, offers an almost unlimited assortment of vistas, 
as Lenort used not only the multiplicity of natural forms, but also the terrain's slightly rolling contours with stunning effectiveness. That's awesome. I wish I could see it. I want to see it. The formal gardens near the palace provide a rational transition from the frozen architectural forms of the natural living natural living ones. Here, the elegant forms of trimmed shrubs and hedges define the tightly designed geometric units. <gasps> Ooh, did I get something? Stephen is who? Thank you so much. You're so kind. Thank you, thank you. Stephen is who? Thank you. I really appreciate that. It means a lot. Let me just check in on you guys real quick. Um, hi, Giant Squid. Is Martina taking questions through Streamlabs or through here on DLive? Um, I mean, Streamlabs will certainly get my attention. <laughs> yes, please. You had a message with it. Oh, shit. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Okay. It says one of Louis' mistresses, Athenes, Athenes de Montespan was a costumer of fortune teller and dark sorceresses, Madame Voisin. She provided poisons to the French nobility of Versailles. Voisin also performed black masses, possibly child sacrifice and abortions. Holy shit, that's crazy. Oh my god. Wow. Damn. Interesting. Thank you for that. See, I love you guys. My chat is always so fascinating. You guys are always really interesting and smart. Where's my Streamlabs link? Um, you can go to this up here, streamlabs.com slash Martina Mercota TV. Here, I'll try to type it out. Stream, streamlabs.com slash Martina Mercota TV. Yeah, the link is like right above me if you can read it. Streamlabs.com slash Martina Mercota TV. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Oh, hi, Magnus. Thank you for that. Um, so the formal gardens near the palace provided a rational... Did I read that? A rational... Okay. So the formal gardens near the palace provided a rational transition from the frozen architectural forms to the natural living ones. Here, the elegant forms of trimmed shrubs and hedges define the tightly... Uh, design geometric units. Each unit is different from its neighbor and has a focal point in the form of a sculptured group, a pavilion, a reflecting pool, or a fountain. Cool. Farther away from the palace, the design loosens as trees in shadowy masses, screen or frame views open of open countryside. Lenort carefully composed all vistas and all vistas for maximum effect. Light and shadow, formal and informal, dense growth and open meadows all play against one another in unending combinations and variations. No photograph or series of photographs can reveal the design's full richness. Uh, full richness. The park unfolds itself only to people who actually walk through it. That sounds fucking amazing. Holy shit. Has anybody gone to the Palace of Versailles or walked through the gardens or any of that stuff? That sounds really cool. I'm going to go back now to the, um, the other photo where it shows the aerial view. Just so that we can kind of look at that. So, yeah, all of the... Oh, God, my ears are hurting. Clip-on earrings hurt, man. Fuck. I do this for you guys. I do it for you. Ow. So yeah, there's something. Remember how the axes and like all of, like this like city is all focused like in his bedroom or something. I don't know exactly where. I mean, I'm I'm guessing like something like here. If 
focal point. Um, and then there's his gardens, this like pools and various things. And then there's the trees. I don't know, it sounds really cool. I wish I could see it in real life. Dope. Um, band guy next week, Graves, last name Graves. Yeah, I'm doing, uh, if you guys please check out, I don't think it's next week actually, it's in 10 days. So the following Sunday, I'm going to have on the 14th, so think of the Ides of March, on the 14th, I am going to be on DLive and I'm going to have uh, Michael Graves, the former frontman of the Misfits. And we'll be doing an interview, live performance, all that stuff. So that's really exciting. Yeah. So guys, make sure you check it out. Oh, yay. Something's happening. Oh, Max McDonald, hey. Cool. All right, let me see where you are, Max McDonald. You... Martina, I saw the weirdest video today. I was trying to see if you had a Wikipedia, Wikipedia page, and instead a man named Ajit Pai came up. It looked like a music video of you dancing with him. Looked like fun. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Ajit Pai is the uh, head of the FCC. And during the time when he was repealing net neutrality, I don't know why everyone was freaking out about it and acting like it was killing babies. But I was working at the Daily Caller at the time, and they were doing this silly video with Benny Johnson, who I fucking can't stand. Benny Johnson does the corniest, oh, cringy, like clickbait type shit. But anyway, he had this grand idea to make this silly video with Ajit Pai. And they were like, do you want to like dance in it with him? I'm like, yeah, sure. I had a cigarette in my mouth. I was just like, mm. just like dancing with him. And then the media freaked the fuck out about it and tried to like hone in on and research who everybody was. But I was the only one that they could find information on. And they tried to dig up some dirt and make me look like a bad guy. They spread around all over the internet that I was a pizza gator or some shit. Because I have a silly pizza gate video on my YouTube. Check out my YouTube, guys. <laughs> The video's hilarious. And actually, the guy who uh, made that video is the guy that I'm talking about, my friend Paul, who hooked me up with Michael Graves from The Misfits and did a documentary on him. He, when I was living in Brooklyn as a burlesque dancer, we did a silly video about my experience on the deep web and the cheese pizza uh, code word and just like made it into a funny, silly video. And the media, when I worked at Daily Caller, saw that video and they spun this narrative that I'm some sort of promoter of like comet ping pong shooting or some shit. I don't know. It's fucking ridiculous. But anyway, that's what they do. That's what they do. Yeah. FCC chairman. That's what it is. Larry Bird was a fucking basketball player. Yeah, that's right. Basically, I was trying to like talk about Hillary Clinton and like her connection to like some, the bird guy. I don't know. Something bird. It was like uh, some grand wizard of the KKK. And I was, I said something about Larry Bird. And then like Paul, like you just hear Paul, like the guy making the video in the background goes, Larry Bird is a basketball player. And then all these like shots of like Larry Bird, like scoring, I was going to say scoring touchdowns. No, scoring baskets. <laughs> I know basketball. Okay. Sc scoring shots. Um, yeah, it's it's funny. It's a really funny video. You guys should check it out. There's really nothing bad in it. I basically make fun of myself for being a conspiracy theorist about it. Robert Bird, that's what it is, yeah. I got the birds confused. My bad. This is what I do. I told you, I'm like dyslexic with shit. I can be like retarded about that stuff. It's just kind of funny. Like the video ended up just being really funny. Yeah, exactly, Giant Squid. Thank you. It was... Freaking Cernovich, not me, but they made me like the lead, the the, the head campaigner of freaking Pizzagate. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I just made a silly goddamn video. You're trying to make me a bad guy just to make a G Pi look bad. Anyway, I have a chest. I don't know. 
if I should uh, do that. Not like I get a lot of coins or anything, but I have this chest to give out. But I'm going to do it in a little bit. So let me just finish up reading and uh, yeah. We'll wrap this up in a little bit. So where were we? Uh, 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 uh. Oh, now we're going to England. Okay, so let's check England out. All right, this is our last section, guys. So any last donations, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, please, 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 I will uh, read your donations out next time. Actually, did I read the other donations last time? Let me check. Let me check for you YouTube people. Let me let me check this out. Um, I don't really have anything. Yeah, no, just some subscribers, some. But Google too gave two dollars eleven days ago, but I'm pretty sure I must have read that. Said so the greatest Netherlands contribution is fries. But Google do said I donated to PayPal and Streamlabs just now. Oh, okay. This should get you enough cheese to last uh, for at least two days, says Josh Randall. Thank you. Uh, he laughs because when I stream, I sometimes have a cheese platter. I love cheese. I'm a cheese person. Um, okay. I don't know. We'll get back to reading. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. Okay, so England, we all see this? We're ready to go? So England, um, or in England, in sharp distinction to France, the common law and parliament kept royal power in check. England also differed from France and Europe in general in other significant ways. Although an important part of English life, religion was not the uh, con contentious issue it was on the continent. Ooh, yay. Now, now some donations are coming in. We got $5, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Let me read what you said here. Okay, Max McDonald, $5, thank you. Was Ajit Pai a nice guy? Who was the nicest guy in politics you met, Martina? I usually think they're all jerks, but I am sure there are some nice people. Um, well, that's a good question. You guys know that I find a lot of people to be jerks, a lot of people to be fame whores and you know wannabes and, and all that stuff, yeah. Um, Ajit Pai was really nice. He was really nice, but that's because he's not some sort of e-celeb or wannabe uh, you know, media personality. He's not a media personality. I feel like the media people are really bad. The activists are really bad. The the media people, the e celebs are really bad. Uh, Ajit Pai actually works in government. I mean, I'm not saying all everyone works in government so nice, but uh, he was really nice. He was a really really nice guy. Yeah, and in fact, he has a personal Twitter account, and he was like follows me and was like super nice, and we DM'd, and I was like. Oh my god, he just has that really bubbly personality. He's really nice. Sweet. He's a really, really sweet man. Yeah. I agree. I don't know who the nicest is. I have to think long and hard about that, but Ajit Pai is, is on the top of the list. He's a really nice guy. That whole thing ruined my reputation, um, but I don't blame him. I blame Benny for it. Yeah, Ajit Pai was really nice. Um, going back to it. All right. 
let's get back to this. So we have England in sharp contrast to France and general the rest of Europe. The religious affiliations of the English included Catholicism, Anglicanism, Protestantism, and Puritanism, the English version of Calvinism. In the economic realm, England was the only country other than the Dutch Republic to take advantage of the opportunities offered by overseas trade. England, like the Dutch Republic, possessed a uh, large and powerful navy as well as excellent maritime capabilities. In the realm of art, the most important English contributions were in the field of architecture, much, uh, much of it, as in France, in incorporating classical elements. Okay, so then we have Sir Christopher Wren, New St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England. I wonder if I've seen this. Hmm. It's 1675 to 1710. Wren's Cathedral replaced the old Gothic church. The facade design owes much to the Italian architects Palladio and Bramoni, Bramani, Bramini, Bramini. The dome recalls that of St. Peter's in Rome, which we went over last time. So let me get a picture up for you guys. Bromini. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, what am I doing here? Oh my god, okay. I'll get you your picture. There you go. Let's look at some of the details here. Love the cross up top. Cool. Love it. It's gold got a clock they like their clocks cool I'm not sure if I've seen this is this like where is this in London all right So this is Christopher Wren. London's majestic St. Paul's Cathedral is the work of England's most renowned architect, Christopher Wren, 1632 to 1723. A mathematical genius, love it, and a skilled engineer whose work won Isaac Newton's praise. Wow. Wren became professor of astronomy in London at age 25. Mathematics led to architecture, and Charles II, roughly 1660 to 1685, asked Wren to prepare a plan for restoring the old Gothic Church of St. Paul. Wren proposed to remodel the building based on Roman structures. Within a few months, within a few months, the Great Fire of London, which destroyed the old structure and many churches in the city in 1666, gave Wren his opportunity. Wren had traveled through France where the splendid palaces and state buildings being created in and around Paris must have impressed him. He also closely studied prints illustrating Baroque architecture in Italy. In St. Paul's, he harmonized Palladian, French, and Italian Baroque features. For its size, the cathedral was built with remarkable speed in a little more than 30 years, and and Wren lived to see it completed. Wait, what? For its size, the cathedral was built with remarkable speed in little more than 30 years, and Wren lived to see, its com see it completed. Yeah, that's because we saw also with um, New St. Peter's how, I mean, it bounced around. People died and didn't get to finish it. The... Bromini guy, the uh, Balducci guy, we got, uh, I think Michelangelo, did he? No, was it Michelangelo? One of those big famous ones also kind of worked on that. And they, they came and died and re everyone had to redo shit. So, wow, that is pretty good. 
The building's form underwent constant refinement during construction, and Wren did not determine... Uh, Wren did not determine the final appearance of the towers until after 1700. In the striking skyline composition, two foreground towers act effectively as foils to the Great Dome. Wren must have known similar schemes that Italian architects devised for St. Peter's in Rome to solve the problem of the relationship between the facade and dome. Because if you remember the one in St. Peter's, the dome was really set far back, which made it not viewable when you're looking right in front of it, you had to like really go far back in order to see the dome. Certainly the influence of Bromini uh, appears in the upper levels who did the New St. Peter's as well. He was one of the like three that worked on New St. Peter's. So certainly Bromini, Br the influence of Bromini appears in the upper levels and lanterns of the towers and that of Palladio in the lower levels. Further, the superposed paired columnar porticos have parallels in contemporaneous French architecture. <coughs> Wren's skillful eclecticism integrated all of these foreign features into a monumental unity. Wren designed many other London churches after the Great Fire. Even today, his towers and domes punctuate the skyline of the great city with St. Paul's Dome the tallest of all. Wren's legacy was significant and long-lasting in both England and colonial America. See chapter 11. Wow, cool, interesting. I did not know that. So, as an England person, American person, that's interesting. I'm going to look out for that. Let me just check in on you guys, because that's the end of the chapter we have here. Whew. Some big words there. Phew. Yeah, sometimes it gets kind of crazy. Um, anyway, so guys, uh, if you just came in here... Oh, Kitty is scratching at the door. Give me one second. Kitty, you want to join? Come say hi, kitty. Come say hi to everybody. Come here. Come here. Say hi. This is Kitty Cat. That was a lot of fuss, kitty. A lot of fuss. <laughs> a lot of fussing about. You okay? You don't like the door closed, do you? Sorry, just giving her a little attention. We're pretty much done here, but what was I saying? Oh, yeah, I wanted to tell you guys about... Um, the stream that I have on the 14th on D Live, you could watch on the 15th. It will premiere live on YouTube, but uh, on the 14th on D Live, I'm going to have uh, Michael Graves, who is the former, was the lead singer. No, not the flowers, Kitty. She wanted. She wants to like eat these beautiful flowers. No, flowers are not for you. Look how pretty real flowers are. Not for you, they're for me. Go. Oh, thank you, Nax McDonald. Thank you, thank you. Let me read what you have. Martina, play this video for the audience. I think you can. You are in the last 20 seconds of the video, everyone would love to see it, I believe. YouTube link below. Oh, God, this concerns me. I don't, I don't know if I want to see this. I can't play other people's videos. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Daily Caller video. <laughs> Why do you think people want to see it? Let me share the link with the chat. 
It's so stupid. Oh my god, it's so bad. It's so bad. Uh, okay, yeah, no, let me... Let me share with you guys, yeah, on the 14th, I'm going to have Michael Graves, the former lead singer of The Misfits, will be on the show. We will be live on DLive, so you guys can come and join me. Uh... Yeah, you guys can join me and um, ask him questions. You can be a part of the live thing. We'll be doing interview. He will be performing live. It'll be really fun. So the 14th, let me just play you guys actually a little, little preview commercial going on. Let me find it. Let me find it. Um... YouTube. Just like 25 seconds. All right. All right, yeah, that was just a quick little commercial going on for that. Yeah, like I said, former lead singer of The Misfits, Michael Graves, he's really talented. He actually doesn't even just do that punk kind of screaming kind of singing. He is amazing at singing has a great voice plays guitar and uh he'll be playing some things and that's why i interlace some of mine that like angel girl that you saw that's me uh, i'm known as lady alchemy i was a performer in new york city who got blacklisted and all that stuff so we will be having a chat because he seems to have a similar story he's pretty based he's you know on our side politically he's had a lot of issues himself and uh I don't know. He's been through the ringer. I've been through the ringer. So we're, we'll have a little chit chat. Engage. We'll, he'll perform. I wish I could perform live with him, like the little preview clip. But maybe another time. Uh, I'll have a studio set up in a few months, maybe, that we can do some sort of shows and some cool things. But for now, I'm just going to do some interviews. I'm also going to. I don't have a date quite yet, but uh, I'm talking to Lloyd Kaufman, who. You know, does trauma films. He did, uh, oh God, I keep forgetting. I, what is it? The uh, Toxic Avenger guy. Uh, he's really cool. He's also politically on our side. He's really fun. Great guy, great guy. Huge fan of Lady Alchemy. So it's cool. Was that loud? Oops, my bad. I didn't adjust the levels. Sorry. All the fans of the video comment how gorgeous that really I am so used to getting crap from people I'm not used to positive comments so I kind of avoid it I avoid looking at things like that but look at that once you're out of that little online circle people are quite nice huh interesting Why are they calling him a liar and a thief? They're so mean. Oh my god, people are being really mean to him. He's really nice. The cheat pie is really sweet. Anyway, okay, let's finish up here. I think I'm pretty much done, but let me just double check. Oh, yes, yes. Let me open this chest real quick. Got it. Oh my god, I didn't play the piano music. Uh, 
Okay, so we have Critiqued, who got 4.6 lino, I guess. Oh, God, my contacts are hurting me. Hey, kitty. Steven is who? Yeah, he got 3.1. And I haven't seen this person comment, but they're... Oh, he just gave me two lemons. But yeah, I gave him 2.5 and he gave me two back. Thank you so much. <laughs> welcome, Critiqued. Welcome, welcome. Uh, nice to see new people. I mean, subscribe. Uh, we do art history. We do etiquette. We haven't done etiquette in a while, but mostly artsy kind of stuff. Different various artsy things, so... Thank you, Mario88. Really cool. Very cute. Thank you, thank you. Martina, another 70s movie soon. Yes, yes. I just want to make sure that the movie can play on YouTube, but it concerns me because we did really well on Halloween where we played a lot of awesome old movies. We had a lot of fun. We did it for uh, Christmas. We did it for New Year's Eve where we watched New Year's Evil. But I had that issue with uh, the Invasion of the Bee Girls on YouTube, so that kind of concerns me. So we did it on D Live yesterday, but uh, I'm going to try to do a movie that we can translate over onto YouTube as well. Let's just double check. Let's just double check what we're working on here um, in regard to this current stream. And uh, I think we've wrapped up pretty much. Yeah, so the big picture, Europe 1600s to 1700s, Italy and Spain. You guys can check out the previous videos to see the details and all that, but this is the big picture. In contrast to the precision, pre precision and orderly rationality of Renaissance classicism, Italian Baroque art is dynamic, theatrical, and ornate. Oh, I love that. In architecture, Francesco Borromini emphasized the sculptural qualities of buildings. The facades of his churches are not flat front pieces, but undulating surfaces that provide a fluid transition from exterior to interior space. The interiors of his buildings pulsate with energy and feature complex domes that grow organically from curving walls. Undulating. The greatest Italian Baroque sculptor was Bernini. Yeah, I would say he's the greatest sculptor ever. Who was also an important architect. In Ecstasy of St. Teresa, he marshaled the full capabilities of architecture, sculpture, and painting to create an intensely emotional experience for worshippers, consistent with the Counter Reformation principles of using artworks to inspire devotion and piety. Again, the importance of art and culture um, and the influence it has on people. Remember, this is the Ecstasy of St. Teresa, 1645 to 1652. In painting, Caravaggio broke new ground by employing stark and dramatic contrast of light and dark, and by setting religious scenes in everyday locales filled with rough-looking common people. The greatest, so there, he was the modern artist back in the day who didn't really care too much about perfection and beauty and was more about creating something real and, if I dare say, ugly. But his lighting was amazing. The light and dark was awesome, awesome, awesome. In uh, the greatest Spanish Baroque painter was Diego Velasquez, 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 court painter to Philip IV, roughly 1621 to 1665. His masterwork, Las Meninas, is celebrated is a celebration of the art of painting. It mixes true spaces, mirrored spaces, picture spaces, and pictures within pictures. That's this famous one right here where you can see there's like a mirror reflection, there's a painting, there's the painter, there's the scene going on, there's the backdrop, there's paintings of paintings. It's a uh, yeah, pretty historic piece. And then we have Flanders and the Dutch Republic. In the 17th century, Flanders remained Catholic and under Spanish control. Flemish Baroque art is closely tied to the Baroque, of Ar Baroque art of Italy. The leading Flemish painter of this era was Peter Paul Rubens. 
his paintings of the career of Marie uh, de Medici exhibit Baroque splendor and color and orna ornament and feature Rubens' characteristic robust and foreshortened figures in swirling motion. So yeah, um, what's his face? Uh, Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens was uh, friends with this Medici broad who uh, he did a series of paintings for her and this is her uh, arriving in France with all these Rubenesque figures and everything, these naked ladies. Okay. The Dutch Republic, the Dutch Republic received official recognition of its independence from Spain in the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648. Worldwide trade and banking brought prosperity to its predominantly Protestant citizenry which largely rejected church art in favor of private commissions of portraits, genre scenes, landscapes, and still lifes. Still lives? Still lifes. Rembrandt, the greatest Dutch artist of the age, treated a broad range of subjects, including religious themes and portraits. His oil paintings are notable for their dramatic impact and subtle gradations of light and shade, as well as the artist's ability to convey human emotions. Rembrandt was also a master printmaker renowned for his etchings. This is one of Rembrandt's famous ones. It's uh, The Night Watch, 1642. Franz Hals produced innovative portraits of middle-class patrons in which a lively informality replaced the formulaic patterns of traditional portraiture. Jacob van... Rusdale specialized in landscapes depicting specific places, not idealized Renaissance settings. Peter Clay, Clay's, Clay's, Clay's painted Venitas still lifes featuring meticulous depictions of worldly goods and reminders of death. Vermeer specialized in painting Dutch families in serenely opulent homes. Vermeer's convincing representation of interior space depended in part on his use of the camera obscura. Then we have what we did today, which is France and England. The majority art pat the major art patron in 17th century France was the Sun King, Louis XIV, who built a gigantic palace and garden complex at Versailles featuring sumptuous, sumptuous, Furnishings and sweeping vistas. Among the architects Louis employed were Charles Le Brun and Jules Hardouin Mansart, who succeeded in marrying Italian, Baroque, and French classical styles. The leading French proponent of classical painting was Nicolas Poussin, who spent most of his life in Rome and championed the grand manner of painting, which called for heroic or divine subjects and classical compositions with figures often modeled on ancient statues. In England, architecture was the most important art form. Christopher Wren harmonized the architectural principles of Palladio with the Italian Baroque and French classical styles. And here is what we just saw, the Wren in New St. Paul's in London, 1675 to 1710. So there we go. The next stream, uh, this will be rerunning tomorrow on YouTube and I will be, in, it will be premiering on YouTube. The, this video, if you missed a little bit of it earlier, you can catch up and I will be live. There'll be another live chat. The chat is always fantastic. And sometimes the chat on YouTube is different than the chat on DLive. So I hope you guys join us there. Um, so yeah, if you're not following me on YouTube, uh, please, please join us on YouTube. It is, uh, youtube.com slash Martina Marcota TV, youtube.com slash Martina Marcota TV. And, uh, yeah, subscribe and join us. Uh, if you missed any of this today, we will be going over it tomorrow and the live audience is really, really fun. Um, you guys are fantastic as a chat and I love, um, kitty, stay away from my flowers. Those are my flowers. Go. Yeah. So the YouTube chat is really fun. You guys should join us in there. 
I was actually going to be a math teacher. I tutored math for many years. I was someone's math teacher at one point. A few people. I have some people that pop in sometimes and are like, Martina tutored me in math. <laughs> or I taught math with Martina. Uh, so, yeah. Let's... What was I going to say? One last thing. Uh, yeah, so next time after I premiere this tomorrow this rerun and we're gonna be in the live chat all together come join our crew uh the following stream will be europe and america 1700s to 1800s and we're gonna get into the rococo <gasps> Ooh, how fun the rococo time period look at that luxury yes 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 so please join us it's really fun I'm now going to get out of here. Unless anyone has any last stream labs or things. Okay, bye Magnus. <laughs> um, what did I tutor? I did mostly algebra, but I tutored a little bit of calculus. I love calculus. I did all the calcs, calc one, two, three, mul yeah, multivariable calculus, all that stuff. But uh, in order to teach, I enjoy teaching algebra, college algebra, high school algebra. So, all right, I'm going to try to get out of here. I'll see you guys tomorrow in the chat. Love ya.